If you were trapped in a seven-story office building, where an average day on the job suddenly turned into a brutal death game against 80 of your own co-workers, what would you do? Most of these employees aren't cut out for violence, but by the time that it's all over, the people who you'd least expect are going to turn into cold-blooded killers. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the corporate death game in The Belko Experiment. These office workers are about to find out just how cutthroat the corporate world can be. Early one morning in Bogota, Colombia, this guy Mike is stuck in traffic on the way to his job at Belco Industries, a large office building on the outskirts of the city. His co-workers are also all filing in, expecting just another average day at the office, but that was their biggest mistake. As he pulls up to the building, the COO Barry notices a few things that seem a little out of the ordinary. The company hires both Americans and locals from here in Colombia, but for some reason, it looks like today all of the local employees are being sent home. On top of that, their regular security guards have been replaced by a team of heavily armed soldiers who are thoroughly checking every car before it enters as if they're expecting some kind of trouble. After getting to the office, Mike notices one of the new security guards walking into an abandoned hangar on the far side of the property. He decides to call down to his friend Evan, the regular security guard, and asks him if he knows anything about what's been going on. But he says that he hasn't been told anything either. Suddenly, they're interrupted when a loud noise comes from the the building's PA system and a strange voice orders them all to listen very closely. The voice begins by explaining that right now, there are 80 of them in the building, but by the end of the day, most of them are going to be dead. They can increase their chances of survival by completing a series of challenges, and for the first challenge, two employees must be dead within the next half hour. It can be anyone, killed in any way and chosen by any method, but if they fail, then there will be severe consequences. And after saying this, the voice leaves them all to decide. Okay, man. Whoever called out sick today got lucky as hell. Can you seriously imagine sleeping in and enjoying the day off only to find out that everyone who actually did show up to work ended up in a death game before they could even get to lunch? I'd be on my way to get some lottery tickets and see if I could keep this lucky streak going because there's no damn way that I'm going back into the office tomorrow morning after hearing about something like this. As for the chumps who actually clocked in today, they probably thought that they'd just have to survive another eight hours in the office. But now they've just found out that they're literally going to have to fight for their own survival. It looks like Jigsaw himself must have become the CEO of this place overnight. And if this announcement is to be believed, then they'll have to sacrifice two of their own co-workers just to give themselves any chance of survival. That's where we run into our first major problem. Although the voice on the intercom definitely sounded convincing, as it stands right now, they have no way of knowing if this is actually a genuine threat or if they've simply been chosen as the test subjects in some kind of messed up social experiment. With so many strange and sudden changes going on, like the beefed up security, the local employees being sent home, and the phone lines suddenly going down, it's understandable why some people might immediately start to panic. But the truth is that freaking out is only going to make the situation worse. The key in this moment is to remain as calm as possible and try to think about things from a rational perspective. Since human psychology plays such a large role in the success or failure of these kind of companies, it's not out of the question to think that they might be willing to set up some kind of experiment to help them better to understand certain aspects of the average worker's mind, especially during times of intense stress. Here in the United States, something like this probably wouldn't fly because of the serious ethical and legal concerns that the company would face. But since the office is located in Colombia, where the laws are are very different, it's definitely possible that the heads at Belco wanted to try this out as a new and exciting way to mess with their employees. So with that being said, there are really only two ways to figure out the truth here. Either they sacrifice two people within half an hour, or they just let the timer run out peacefully and wait to see what happens next. Now, besides the fact that there's no morally acceptable way for them to choose who to eliminate, especially in such a short amount of time, we also have to pay close attention to exactly what the voice is telling us. They said that by the end of the day, most of the 80 employees in the building will be dead, which means that the first two victims are only just the beginning. So whether it's all just a test or not, they'd be much better off working together to try and find another solution. 
With 80 people, they'll be able to split up into teams to approach the situation from different angles. The main focus should be on getting out of the building as quickly and safely as they can. But we're about to find out that leaving the property is basically impossible. Another group could try to communicate back to the voice by holding up signs to the security cameras with questions like, who are you? And why are you doing this? Since that might help them to better understand the purpose of the game and the goals of the person who's behind it all. At the same time, the most creative thinkers in the office could try to brainstorm some potential loopholes or alternative solutions that might allow them to pass the first round without having to immediately resort to violence. Now, if people really do start dropping dead at the end of 30 minutes, then we're going to have to circle back and reevaluate our strategy. But for now, unless the situation changes, then our best option is to stay calm and work together to find a peaceful solution. Most of them think that it must be some kind of joke, but Mike decides to evacuate everyone on his floor just in case. One woman who just walked by into the lobby gets scared and tries to run for the door when all of a sudden, a set of impenetrable metal shields rises up to cover every exit and window around the entire building, leaving them trapped with no way out. Mike's friend Terry tries to call the police, but he can't get any reception on his cell phone. And it seems like all of the building's landlines have already been cut off, so there's no way to call for help either. A large group gathers down in the front lobby where everyone's desperately trying to figure out what to do next. Taking a look at the door, the building's head maintenance worker, Bud, says that he might be able to cut through it with a blowtorch. So he and his helper, Lonnie, head off to find one. Meanwhile, another group of workers goes up to the roof, hoping to signal someone who's passing by from there. Barry finally shows up and calls for everyone's attention as the self-appointed leader, encouraging them all to not panic just yet. He thinks that the barriers must be a type of hidden security measure installed by the government, and that someone must have hacked into them as a prank to freak them out, saying that he'll try and find out what's really going on as soon as he can. The people on the roof quickly realize that there's no way anyone is going to see them, and whatever the doors are made out of, Bud's blowtorch can't even get the metal to warm up. As for everyone else, they're having the opposite problem, because it looks like whoever's doing this also turned off the air conditioning. Concerned, Mike pulls Barry to the side and says that he's worried this could be more than just a prank. But with the only other option being to follow the voice's instructions and choose two workers to sacrifice, they decide that all they can do is wait and see what happens. Up on the roof, this guy named Marty starts telling them that it's probably just some kind of corporate test to see how they'll react. When completely out of nowhere, the back of this girl's head suddenly explodes, killing her instantly. In the lobby, the same thing happens to another one of the workers, and the rest of the group immediately starts to scatter for safety, thinking that they must be under attack. As they run for their lives, another two people are killed in the same way, but there's no way to tell where the shots are coming from. Realizing something strange, Barry checks one of the bodies and discovers that the explosion came from inside. That's when Mike realizes that it must be the tracers that the company forced them to get in the back of their heads, and they've been rigged to explode as a part of the game. Panicking, Mike sprints to the bathroom where he locks himself in and tries to solve the problem with some pretty gruesome DIY surgery. But the voice returns, warning him to stop, counting down from 10 seconds before they detonate his device. At the last second, Mike decides to stop, and the voice lets him live for now. But they have no idea how much worse things are about to get. What up, How to Beat crew? Today, I want to talk about something that's been a real pain. My old desk chair. She just ain't cutting it. I spend all day bringing these happy apocalypse guides to you, and this butt needs some love. Wait a minute, if that's me, then whose butt is that? Let's be honest, who else out there suffers from backaches after being glued to their chair all day? My current chair offers zero support, and my posture always feels wonky. That's why I decided to upgrade to the Flexispot C7 ergonomic chair. This bad boy has some seriously cool features that caught my eye. First off, the self-adaptive dynamic system is a game changer. The lumbar support cushion actually adjusts itself based on my movements, no matter how much I fidget. And speaking of customization, the C7 is adjustable in all directions. I can tweak the height, armrests, and even the headrests to fit my exact body type. 
No more hunching over or feeling squished. Another cool feature, the C7 allows for a forward leaning position. This is awesome for those times when I need a break from sitting upright. Recently, it's been a lot of Jet Moto on the PlayStation 1, and uh, if there was ever a game where you needed to sit upright and lock in, I'm sure five of you out there, you know what I'm talking about but comfort doesn't stop at adjustments. The C7 is actually designed to accommodate most heights and builds, but is ideal for individuals between 5'7 and 6'5 in height. Plus, it supports up to 320 pounds. If you're shorter, you may consider the more compact and affordable C3. Speaking of the C3, they have a whole wide range of ergonomic chairs to suit your needs and budget. Check out the C3, a great starter chair at a fantastic price point. So if you're ready to ditch that old chair and sit in luxury, head over to flexaspot.com and use my code C730 at checkout for $30 off your C7 purchase. You're back, well thank you, trust me. Okay, well, damn, I guess this means that they definitely weren't joking. I mean, I've heard of life in the corporate world giving some people a headache, but this is just ridiculous. These pencil pushers just witnessed four of their own co-workers ruthlessly massacred before their very eyes. And if the voice on the intercom really means what they say, then this is only the beginning. The reality of their situation is probably starting to set in by now, but here's a special announcement in case there's anyone left who still didn't get the memo. Attention all Belco employees, you f up. This right here is proof that no matter how good a job may seem, you always need to think carefully about what you're actually signing up for before accepting the offer. At least back at home in the United States, there are laws in place to stop massive companies from forcing their employees into some kind of deadly psychological experiment. But here, the situation is just a little bit different, and you should really read the fine print carefully before writing your name on the dotted line. That's not to mention that the facility itself is built like a prison and located way out in the middle of nowhere, where there isn't much traffic passing by to notice what's going on inside. Plus, when they arrived at the office this morning, they noticed that all of the workers from the local area had been sent home and that a new team of heavily armed military-style guards had taken over security duties. Any one of these factors on its own wouldn't necessarily be an immediate cause for concern, but put them all together and we've got enough red flags popping up that it might have been their sign to pull a quick U-turn and use some of that PTO. But that's not even the biggest mistake that these idiots made. Everything else could be overlooked, but let's not forget that every single person in this building willingly let the corporation install actual f tracking devices into the back of their skulls. I'm sorry, but did you all get your MBAs from Moron University? <laughs> They say that the tracers are meant to find you in case you get kidnapped. And that's great, but look at how quickly the whole we're just doing this for your safety argument turned into sacrifice your coworkers or else we'll make your head explode. Look, I get it, man. Times are tough. In today's economy, people are willing to do just about anything for some health insurance, let alone a whole ass car and an apartment all paid for by the company. But installing an electronic device in the back of your head is exactly where you need to draw the line. As a general rule to live by, if the direction that you're going in starts to sound exactly like the premise of a dystopian sci-fi movie, then it's time to pump the brakes and reevaluate if whatever you're doing is actually worth it. These people didn't just sign a deal with the devil. They volunteered to let the devil put a microchip in their brains. And whatever ends up happening to you after that, it'll be hard for anyone to honestly say that you didn't deserve it. Now they're trapped in this building with no way out. Four of them are dead with more on the way. And if you try to do anything about it, all it takes is the flip of a switch and you're spraying brain jelly all over the TPS reports. I think they've probably all learned their lesson, but by now it's looking like they're just a tad bit too late. And they'll be lucky if any of them make it to 5 p.m. alive. Sorry, Belko family, but uh, you all f***ed up. One of the older ladies takes Mike to get stitched up while his office situation ship, Leandra, goes to the kitchen to get him some ice. In the lobby, Barry tries to talk to Evan into giving him the keys to the security guard's armory. But Evan says that he won't be giving the keys to anybody until they're finally out of this building. By now, everyone is already on edge with everything that's already happened so far. But soon they're going to find out that this is just the beginning. Terrified. This new girl Danny decides to hide out alone down
down in the basement, where she overhears Bud and Lonnie coming to repair the air conditioning unit. Lonnie isn't handling things very well, and he's starting to worry that more of them might be next, but Bud reassures him that everything is going to be alright if they just stay calm. Just then, the voice comes over the PA system for the third time, and this time, the instructions are even worse. Out of the 76 of them that are still alive, they must choose 30 to eliminate before the next round ends in two hours. Otherwise, 60 of them will have to die instead. Okay, it looks like shit just officially got real. When they still weren't sure if the voice was legit or not, they at least had the luxury of everyone believing that they were all on the same team. But now that they know that their lives are really on the line here, their biggest threat is about to become each other. So where do we go from here? Well, the best solution would still be to try and find a way to either escape the building or signal someone from the outside world for help. Getting through those steel shutters won't be easy. But there are two places in the building where those barriers don't exist, the roof and the basement. They might try tunneling out through the basement walls or climbing out through the vents somehow. From the roof, they could try creating a rope out of supplies from around the office and climbing down to the outside of the building to freedom. Since this is a large facility with an industrial kitchen, I'd also consider searching for any propane tanks or other explosives that we might find there and try to create a boom big enough to blow one of the barriers out of its frame, allowing us to escape. Alternatively, they could try setting off all of their car alarms at the exact same time to attract attention with the loud noise, or start a controlled fire on the roof of the building to signal for help. The biggest problem with any of these ideas, though, is that they'll set off the detonator in your head as soon as they catch you trying to break the rules. This means that, besides not being killed by their co-workers, finding a way to defeat those devices should also be their highest priority. Getting them out the old-fashioned way clearly isn't an option, so instead we could try finding a way to block the signal using some kind of makeshift shield. Certain metals, like aluminum, can be used to block RF signals, so I'd head down to the cafeteria and make myself an extra thick aluminum foil hat. The most important thing is to get it done before the voice catches on. And they're probably not going to be happy when they do, so you better hope that it really works, because otherwise you can kiss your cerebellum goodbye. Besides that, we need to get ready for when things inevitably start to go Lord of the Flies here. I'd start by forming alliances with my meat shields, I mean co-workers, as I could, since having as many people on your side as possible will only increase your chances of survival. Now would be a good time to stockpile any improvised weapons that we could get our hands on, and possibly even create some makeshift armor out of random stuff like magazines, duct tape, and kitchen supplies, like our boy Jerry from World War Z. Be sure to check out that How to Beat episode. The best plan would be to quietly sneak away before the real trouble starts, and try to hole up in a defensible position. Our options could be the building's roof or top floor, since this would limit the others to only one potential angle of attack. One of the offices where we could barricade ourselves in with heavy furniture, or even the basement. As an added bonus, the thick concrete walls of the basement might block the explosive device's frequency, allowing you to survive even if they start taking more people out. Chaos erupts as the instructions come to an end, with everyone in the building scrambling to either find some place to hide or arm themselves with some kind of weapon. In the cafeteria, this guy Wendell and his friend Antonio start tearing up the kitchen to grab some knives, terrifying the others who are still looking for a peaceful solution. A fight breaks out when another group of workers tries to stop them, but before things can get too far, Barry steps in and calls for everyone to gather up in the cafeteria to see if they can talk it out. Meanwhile, down in the basement, the pressure finally pushes Lonnie over the edge, and when Bud goes to try and calm him down, he spins around and bashes him hard over the head with a heavy steel wrench. Bud staggers backwards, unable to remember what just happened, with a coconut-sized dent in the front of his skull, and after a moment of confusion, he finally collapses to the floor, dead. Lonnie breaks down with regret after realizing what he's just done, but that's when he spots Danny nervously watching him through the pipes. Terrified, the girl tries to escape around him, but Lonnie grabs her and slams her up against the wall, getting right in her face and ordering her to be quiet. It looks like she's going to be next, but during the scuffle, Danny 
Lonnie manages to kick off the wall and send Lonnie crashing backwards, impaling him through the back of his head on an exposed rebar spike. Back upstairs, a fight breaks out between the two opposing groups while they're trying to figure out what to do next. One side of the argument, led by Mike, says that sacrificing 30 innocent people, even to save everyone else, is completely wrong and out of the question, while the other side, led by Barry, thinks that they need to start seriously considering all of their options. Disgusted, Mike points out that even if they do go through with it, the death count isn't going to stop at just another 30, because there's no way that whoever's behind this would let anyone live to tell the outside world what happened. That's when Leandra suggests that they use some office supplies to make huge banners and hang them on the roof as a way to hopefully signal somebody passing by for help. Barry immediately shuts her down, saying that there's no possible way that the plan will work in time. But with no better ideas coming from anyone, Mike leads most of the survivors to start looking for supplies, while Barry and a small group of his minions decide to take matters into their own hands. Okay, well, that didn't take long. Barry and his followers here are already trying to set things up so that they get to decide who lives and who dies. And pretty soon, they're probably going to start winning more people over to their side, but there's an easy way that we might be able to solve this issue here and now. Here's what I'm thinking. We put it up to a vote to see who's willing to listen to what the voice says, and who still thinks that we should find another plan. Then, whoever voted yes on the sacrifice, congratulations, you're the sacrifice, since you think it's fair to turn against 30 of your co-workers for the safety of the majority. Watch how quickly their attitudes change when they realize that they've just voted to eliminate themselves. Sure, there are ways that you could decide, but they're going to be finding out very quickly that every person's life has value. So coming up with a system where everybody feels like the sacrifices are fairly chosen is going to be impossible. Hopefully, demonstrating this to Barry and his squad will shut them up for a little while and get everyone back on the same team. Mike here is 100% right about the voice not letting anyone live when it's all said and done anyway, which means that working against each other is ultimately self-defeating, but getting 74 people to all agree to work together is not going to be easy, especially when their lives are on the line. The unfortunate truth is that it's most likely only a matter of time before this turns into a bloodbath. So I'd take a hint from what Wendell and the others are doing and start getting ready for a fight to the death. If you let the dangerous ones take the lead unopposed, then they'll round up and kill everyone in the place for their own survival. So it's better to challenge them now and hopefully force them to rethink their strategy before things can go too far. On one of the floors, good old Marty here is back to his conspiracy theories again, this time pouring out the water coolers out of the fear that the company must have put the chemicals in the water to make them more aggressive. Meanwhile, Mike and Leandra go to a supply closet to get some materials for the banners, and it's clear that he isn't happy with the way that she's been acting since people started to die. The way that she sees it, she might be willing to make the tough decisions if it means that she gets to walk out of here alive. But Mike insists that there are no justifiable reasons for sacrificing 30 innocent co-workers. Just then, they notice that the blowtorch is missing from in front of the main door, and that's when Evan realizes what must have happened. They end up finding Barry and his group already in the process of using the torch to break into the security guard's armory. They say that they're doing it to keep the weapons safe, but after just hearing hearing Barry say that they should sacrifice half of the building approximately five minutes ago, Mike isn't so sure that these boys can be trusted. Frustrated, Evan steps in and turns off their supply of fuel, shutting off the torch. The others spin around to confront him, forcing Evan to draw his weapon and start shouting at them to stay back. It's a tense situation, but these three still aren't ready to turn to violence just yet, and Mike is able to talk Evan into giving him the weapon for now. As soon as he does, Barry's group immediately turns the gas on and gets back to work, so Mike shoots out the hose as a way of peacefully stopping them. He and the others quickly leave for the elevators to get back to their original plan, but as they go, Barry makes it clear that he's just made a dangerous enemy. Okay, that was a badass move by Mike, but there's an important opportunity that they're missing here. If I were in Mike's shoes right now, then I'd try convincing Evan to team up with me and Leandra, and then the three of us could barricade ourselves inside of that armory. 
This is a great plan, because not only can no one get inside to attack us without the keys, but we'll also have access to the best weapons in the building to protect ourselves in case someone is crazy enough to try. From there, all that you've got to do is sit back, let the situation outside work itself out, keep your fingers crossed that you aren't one of the people who's randomly eliminated if they fail the challenge, and then deal with the next challenge if you're lucky enough to survive. Oh. It's selfish, but trust me, it would be better than being caught out in the open once the real trouble starts. Clearly, Barry and his crew are planning to escalate things, and as soon as they start doing that, this entire place is going to turn into a PvP zone. So the best solution is to give up on the Kumbaya shit, fortify yourself in a strong defensive position, and get ready to protect yourself until this next round is over. Joining up with the rest of the group, Mike warns them all that they need to be on the lookout for Barry and his minions, but now it's Leandra's turn to start hating. She's worried that standing up to Barry will only make Mike a target, and says that when people's lives are on the line, their beliefs about the difference between right and wrong no longer matter. He's starting to realize that she has a point, but for now, their only choice is to stick to the plan. So they go back to the others as they finish making their banners and head for the roof. Mike leans over the edge, trying to tie the first banner to the side of the building, but the moment that he does, a pair of security guards comes running out and opens fire. One of the shots nails his friend Keith in the hand, causing them to accidentally drop the banner. But Mike quickly grabs another one and gets ready to keep trying. As soon as he does, the voice announces that they'll detonate his explosive if he tries again, and the others are forced to pull him away to get him to finally stop. Defeated, they regroup back on the staircase to try and come up with another plan. But that's when things go from bad to worse. The more that he's been thinking about it, Mike here has started to feel like the work that they were doing at Belco never actually made much sense in the first place, and that maybe the entire company had been designed for nothing but this death game all along. All of a sudden, Barry flies out of a doorway and clubs Mike in the side of the head with a fire extinguisher, sending him tumbling down the next set of steps. Horrified, Leandra tries to talk them out of it, but Barry says that Mike's refusal to play by the rules of the game would have eventually posed a danger danger to them all. Wendell orders Evan to hand over the keys to the armory, but he throws them down to the bottom of the staircase instead. And in a moment of blind rage, Wendell stabs him in the chest with a kitchen knife as Evan bleeds out in the corner. Barry has the others take Leandra and leads them down to the first floor, where they find the security guard's keys. Opening the armory, Barry is surprised to find that there are more weapons and ammo stored inside than the guards at his place could ever possibly need. To him, this must mean that whoever set this game up wanted them to find these weapons further proving his point that their only way out of this is to play by the rules and choose 30 people to sacrifice. After handing one to each of his minions, he sends them out to round up everybody in the building and bring them back to the main lobby, where he's going to take it upon himself to choose which of the others to eliminate according to the voice's demands. Okay, this is pretty much the worst case scenario. Barry here just sent out his kill squad to track down all of the other survivors, and if they don't act fast, then he's going to start picking them off one at a time in order to protect himself and his followers. For everyone else, their only chance here is to get the jump on Barry and his minions now before they're able to get everyone under control. Because once he's able to get past this first step in his plan, any chance of fighting back or escaping is going to become borderline impossible. Barry's crew may have the superior weapons, but what the others have going for them is sheer numbers. Although a few of them will most likely go down in the process, they can easily overwhelm any of the bad guys by just rushing them as a group. And that's better than letting them round you all up like helpless victims. They also have the element of surprise on their side, as Barry's minions only have a general idea of where they might be hiding out. They can use this to catch their attackers from unexpected angles, and hopefully cancel out their superior firepower. The only problem with this idea is that nobody besides Leandra and Mike knows that Barry and his crew have actually crossed the line into killing someone yet. But Mike did already warn them that these guys were going to become a threat, so when they show up waving weapons and demanding for everyone to group up down in the lobby, they should already see where this is going and make the decision that it's time to fight back. 
Antonio heads to the upper floors, while this guy Bradley goes down to search the basement. As he's forcing everyone onto the elevator, he notices Danny hiding behind a stack of supplies, but decides to let her stay hidden after developing a crush on her earlier that day. On the stairs, Mike finally wakes up and discovers Evan's body, only to be caught by Wendell and brought down to the lobby with all of the others. With everyone accounted for, Barry starts off by calling for everyone with younger children under 18 years old to step to one side of the room. Next, he calls for anyone over the age of 60 to line up against the opposite wall. At this point, Terry is starting to get cold feet, but Barry reminds him that he can be next if he doesn't keep his mouth shut. Turning around, he confronts the entire room, saying that either they do this his way, or in less than 20 minutes, almost all of them will be killed. The problem is that there are only seven people over the age of 60 in the group, meaning that he still has to find 22 more to sacrifice. So Barry goes to the crowd and starts choosing people at random to fill out the count. One of the guys who's chosen tries to resist, but Wendell levels his weapon and abruptly shoots him dead. Finally, Barry gets to Mike, and you already know that he's picking him as one of the sacrifices. With the victims chosen, Barry and his minions put on some music to cover up their screams and starts coldly eliminating his fellow workers one person at a time. As he's working his way down the line, Mike quietly tries convincing Terry to give him his weapon, but the asshole snitches on him to Barry instead. Annoyed, Barry tells Terry to man up and eliminate Mike himself, but just as he's about to do it, all of the power in the building suddenly goes out. Okay, this guy has gone completely insane, and he doesn't even realize that he's doing all of this for nothing. If we remember how this all started, the voice on the intercom said that by the end of the day, most of the 80 workers would be dead. Unfortunately, I don't think that 34 out of 80 qualifies as most. So in the end, the people trying to save themselves are just going to have to turn on each other anyway. But Unlike the ones who didn't play along, they'll also have made themselves into cold-blooded killers in the process. With the lights out, this is Mike and the others' best chance to escape. The key here is to stay low, use the darkness to hide from Barry and his guys, and try to ambush them if you have the chance, so that you can get your hands on one of their weapons. The only goal at this point has become self-preservation, and with time about to run out, either 30 people will be killed in the chaos, or they're gonna fail the challenge. And the explosives will take out double that before moving on to the next round. There's honestly not that much you can do about it now, besides try not to die and hope for the best. Avoid Barry and his minions, or take them out when you can. Use cover to stay protected and defend yourself however you can from whoever you have to. And when that timer runs out, keep your fingers crossed that you aren't one of the ones who goes boom. If they fail the challenge, then that should thin their numbers down to only 16 survivors left. But the final round is going to be the worst one of them all. Hearing the commotion upstairs, Danny here saw what was happening and quickly rushed back to the basement to shut down the circuit breaker. The sudden darkness allows everyone to make a run for it, but countless people are killed as Barry and his minions react by blindly unloading into the panicked crowd. Downstairs, Danny sees her friend Roberto on the elevator and joins up with him just in time, climbing through the maintenance hatch to hide. Bradley here starts trying to get the power back on, but while he's distracted, a group of survivors surround him and brutally beat him to death with their bare hands. Up above, Antonio ambushes Mike and his friend Peggy on the stairs staircase, but they're able to win the battle when Mike overpowers him and Peggy stabs the man in the chest, killing him. As for Barry, he tells the rest of his men to sweep the building and take out anyone who they can find without worrying about keeping track of the kill count anymore. Terry chases Leandra down to one of the offices, but she quickly takes apart a paper cutter and grabs the blade to defend herself. That's when the voice announces that there's still one elimination short and have only two minutes left to hit their goal before 30 more of them go kaboom. Hiding underneath a desk, Leandra waits for the perfect moment before slashing Terry's thigh with the paper cutter. But just as she stands over him begging for his life, she realizes that she can't do it. Just then, the voice announces that time is officially up, and since they failed to reach 30 victims, now 31 more of them are going to be killed. All around the building, the explosives and the workers' skulls begin to detonate one at a time. 
with nothing that anyone can do to protect themselves besides hoping that their number doesn't come up. Finally, the bloodshed ends as quickly as it started, but the voice isn't done with them just yet. Over the speakers, they announce that now it's time for the game's final round. They all have one hour to kill as many people as they can, and at the end, whoever has the highest body count will be allowed to leave. Right now, Barry is in the lead with 11 eliminations, and Wendell is the only other person left alive who's even close. Okay, these new rules just completely changed the game from pure survival to a manhunt for Barry and Wendell. Now the only chance of getting out of here for anyone else is to kill the two of them and become the leader. There isn't much of a point in going after anyone besides Barry at first, since there is no possible way that anyone other than Wendell could catch up to him. However, if you're able to track down Barry and Wendell and take both of them out, then you can just hide until the rest of the time runs out. And as long as nobody else beats your score, you'll win by default and hopefully still be able to sleep at night, since at least the two people who you had to go after weren't exactly innocent themselves. Fighting Barry head-on is going to be extremely difficult, since not only is he well-armed, but he also happens to be ex-Special Forces. Knowing this, the best strategy would be to catch him by surprise, or attempt to lure him into some kind of trap. As it turns out, Leandra is about to announce her location to the entire building, which could actually be a good way of trapping Barry. The only problem is that Barry technically doesn't have to do anything. Unless somebody goes on an absolute rampage, then all that he has to do is just stay hidden until the time runs out. No matter what choice you make, getting rid of Barry is not going to be easy. But it's also your only chance at survival, so you're going to have to get it done if you want to live. Once we deal with the main threats, then we still have to figure out what happens to the others. Something worth pointing out here is that the voice said that the person with the highest kill count gets to live, but he never actually said that everyone else has to die. In reality, he's most likely going to kill them anyway, but this is something that I'd mention to the others, because while they can cling to this sliver of hope, I can selflessly take on the burden of dealing with Barry, and then whatever happens when it's all over, either way, I get to live. Hearing the announcement, Barry and Wendell immediately start taking out anyone who they can find. Barry then gets on the elevator where Danny and Roberto are still hiding, but for some reason, Roberto here decides to start yapping loud as hell, and Barry quickly opens fire at them through the ceiling. Danny manages to jump off, but Roberto panics and gets caught between the elevator and the floor, crushing him to death. In the lobby, Leandra finds Marty gathering up the undetonated explosives from the bodies with a plan to use them to blow a hole through one of the walls. It's actually a great idea, but Leandra refuses to leave without Mike, and she decides to announce over the intercom that she's waiting for him on the first floor, despite knowing that this is going to attract the dangerous people too. While waiting for Mike, she goes to the kitchen looking for a bottle of water, but ends up running into Wendell who's fresh off of a recent kill. Raising her weapon, she fires a shot that hits Wendell in the arm, but he immediately starts shooting back while on the ground, taking out Marty and his friend. Leandra manages to close the distance and pin Wendell to the ground, where she finally kills the creep by burying a fire axe into his face. Back in the lobby, Mike makes it to Leandra, but Barry quickly finds them too. In the chaos, Leandra ends up taking a shot to the chest, and unfortunately, it's not looking good. Barry catches Danny on the other elevator and abruptly shoots her dead. While Barry's distracted, Mike drags Leandra into one of the offices and hides her in a storage closet. But after telling him that she loves him, she finally succumbs to her injuries, leaving only Barry and Mike still alive. Diving out of the locker, Mike circles around and tackles Barry from behind, but this guy won't be going down easily. It's a brutal fight, with Barry easily kicking Mike's ass all while a corporate welcome video plays in the background. But Mike eventually manages to get the upper hand using improvised weapons that he finds nearby, and ends the battle by beating Barry to death with a tape dispenser, leaving him as the only survivor. With all 79 others down, the voice congratulates Mike for being the last man standing, and two of the security guards escort him out of the abandoned hangar. Inside, they take him to a monitoring station where he's brought face to face with the man behind the voice himself. These psychos actually sit him down to try and get him to do a post-game interview, saying that they're from an organization that studies human behavior in ways that the US government clearly wouldn't approve of. That's when Mike reveals that he's grabbed the undetonated explosives 
on his way out of the building and secretly hidden one on everyone here in the room. Mike leaps out of his chair and makes a break for the switchboard, flipping the switch on each of the explosives besides his own and grabbing a rifle to clean up the rest. Heartbroken and confused, Mike staggers back out into the daylight as someone in another monitoring station with cameras on several other survivors announces that it's time to begin Phase 2. Well, if that wasn't the worst day at work that these people have ever had. If you were in this situation, what the hell would you do? Let us know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out that How to Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. We'll see you all in the next video and have a damn good day.